Shelley Sullivan, welcome to The Mentor. Thanks, Mark. Thanks long for time. having me. Long, long time. I haven't seen you since, uh, I think it was the last series of The uh, Celebrity Apprentice when you were one of the advisors. Yes. Going back to probably 2016, I think. Yes, That's that the last long. series I ever did. Um, and um, it was uh, pretty crazy. I mean, it's a bit different than what we do these days. Uh, like production was a big deal in those days. The crew was huge. Yeah, it was massive. I remember going in and saying, the boardroom being made up in a studio and just how much effort and energy went into it. I mean, obviously, um, as judges, we didn't do as much heavy lifting as what the contestants did, but it was certainly an eye opener. Well, that that boardroom that that was supposed to be a replica of my boardroom, which sort of was a, very close to my boardroom in my office, um, cost a million bucks to, oh, to, to rebuild. Build. Yeah, no, wow. to, to build, and what they used to do is they after the series had finished, they unpack pack it down. And then when we do another series, they had to re, uh, um, unpack it and build it up again. And wow. As you said, that that's that um, boardroom was built, that set was built within um, a big studio, which is old Channel 7 Studios, which we used to rent. There used to be like 100 crew just for one series. And we would do per episode, which is 42 minutes of television, but 75 hours of filming. It was amazing. I had no idea the volume yeah. of filming versus what the actual airtime and those those – those um, boardroom settings, you'd be there for four or five hours and it'd go for, what, 15, 10, 10 minutes of the entire show. Totally. It is, uh, yeah, it was a bit Was crazy. it worth it for your Labrick Road? Uh, it was okay. It was good for us to launch a, a business and a brand. Um, but at the end of the day, it's reality television, um, which is not necessarily my cup of tea. Yeah. And um, these days especially. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm happy Sir Alan Sugar was doing it. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. It's not my thing. But but it was fun. It was a great experience. Um, I got to meet some good people like yourself and others. Um, you know, uh, it was good branding for our business. You know, that's the sort of shit you have to do if you're launching a new business, which yeah. was uh, launching Yellow Brick Road at the time. But we're here to talk about Shirley Sullivan today. So I want to know, going back to when you first started doing business, how long have you been doing this for? About 29, 29, 29 years. Let's say 30 years, okay? Close to. 30 years. So it would be fair to say you're, in my own you're a veteran. Years. Of I'm a veteran of running my own business, definitely. Totally. Um, and yeah. why did you start running your own business and how old were you? Look, I think when I was at school, I never really knew what I wanted to do when I left school. I just know what, whatever it is I wanted to be, um, create my own destiny. Um, I never thought I was going to leave school and go and work for someone else, but kind of didn't really know what I wanted, what, what I wanted to achieve or, or do with my career. Uh, when I left school. Um, I Is that my, because you're a brat? Yes. I, mean, I was a bit of a brat. I yeah. just wanted to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Yeah, like, fuck you, I'm doing this. Like, I mean, I understand. Like, Can you tell me, what were you thinking? Like, I mean, I know you didn't know what you wanted to do, but. I just wanted to be able to do what what I wanted to do in any area of my life. And in order to do that, you need to be in control of what you're doing, how much income you're earning. Um, and when I left school, all of my friends went off traveling or going to uni. I was like, you know, what am I going to get a part-time job earning $100 a week? Um, at the <laughs> back, back in those days. So. I actually left school and immediately started a company called Elite Productions. I'm talking like when I was 18. Elite Productions. Yeah, putting together fashion shows and fashion parades and I was running Bondi, um, Miss Bondi and East Coast Beach Girl. You mean um, the bikini thing? Yeah. For real? For real. But, but, but back this uh, 30 years ago, this, obviously. This is like wow. way, way back when. So um, I started, I, I can't even remember how I got um, introduced to the people that were running these um, different hotel groups, but they said, look, would you be interested? You're obviously good at putting together events because I, I was always a social person, putting together school events and having parties growing up. They said, would you like to, you're obviously well-connected, um, would you like to run Miss Bondi and East Coast Beach Girl competition? So I fell into that and grew these kind of small little events to like thousands of people showing up and was giving these talent from the modelling competitions to Chadwick's and Chic and various other Australian modelling agencies and then had this crazy idea when I was 21, well, surely I can open up my own modelling agency. It can't be that hard because I'd actually done some part-time work um, with um, a great guy back in the day called Gordon Charles and I was his receptionist. So I was kind of working as a receptionist and running these events on weekends and then I thought, well, I think I could offer a better service to, to models. I could have an agency that was more boutique, that took care of their talent um, uh, a lot better, um, was more interested in building their careers and health and fitness, not just taking them and selling them off, um, you know, and getting the money as an agent. So I started um, Shelley's Model Management back when I was 21 and then that wasn't enough. I didn't having a modelling agency. Then I had a children's modelling agency. Then I had an acting agency. Then I had an editorial agency. So over a period of nine years I grew that agency to probably being one of the largest volumes in Australia to about 1,800 talent 
You know what you strike me as? Someone who hasn't got time to waste. Um, you want to get done what you want to get done and you want to say what you want to say and you won't suffer time wasters. I mean, that's my gut feeling. Just just listening to you now. I mean, I did spend many hours with you in 2016, but I, I don't. you were much quieter then. But this is about you today um, and uh, you you know yourself. Mm-hmm. And did you always know yourself like as, a, as 18, 19, 20 year old? I always did. I think your experience of me in The Apprentice was something that I'd never – I'd never done before. Yeah, and I was almost step. Well, I had to t- I hadn't done it before. I was also led by the fact I was being paid to do a job. Yeah. I wasn't paid. I wasn't asked to come in and be Shelley. I was asked to come in and, and sit alongside you and kind of adjudicate. D- adjudicate. It wasn't really, I mean, normally I'm sitting there. Yeah, totally. Tell- <laughs> I'm I could feel what you're I, doing. I, I used to feel that <laughs> when I was sitting there because I could feel who else was with me? Kerry Ann. Kerry and Kenny. K- uh, K- Kenley. K- yeah, K- Kerry and Kenley. So, you know, I had these two really strong women who knew what the fuck they were talking about and what they're doing with great experience, I could, I could feel you guys. It's like, Mark, get out of the room. We can do yeah, this. Totally. I could feel, <laughs> feel you guys sitting there. And I, that's why you think it was, you know, it was all a bit of bullshit. Like, uh, to be honest, I mean, I, I, with greatest respect to, you know, Donald Trump who put the show together originally and um, et cetera. But, like, uh, you know, I, I felt these two advisors were super strong women. Normally I used to have a one male and one female. Then I got two females. Um, and uh, I could get the sense that you, I'm getting now from you that I could feel you bubbling, like uh, ready to say, what the fuck, get out of the way, exactly. <laughs> Me and Carrie Ann will sort this shit out, which, by the way, you did a lot of the times. So, But but if I go back to an 18-year-old for yourself as 18-year-old and, um, and if, you know, if you're talking to yourself today as an 18-year-old, would you say that, Whilst you were very successful, you did all these things. Would you say to yourself, "Slow down, take a breath"? Would you, or would you just do exactly the same? You say, "I'd do exactly the same because I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't make the mistakes and sometime run down the rabbit holes that that I shouldn't have been down." So that's okay. Run down rabbit holes. You reckon that's okay? That you that's, that's okay. Yeah, go for I, it. I think I think there's some people in life that go and they learn. Um, I've just been um, been able to achieve what I've been able to achieve by being on the ground and learning. From the school of hard knocks, being able to try things, you know, nine times out of ten I don't get it right. But I'm now at an age where I know what I'm doing, I know what works, I know what doesn't work. Um, I've pretty much been in business all my life. Um, I'm now 48, so I did the 30, 30 years of business. Um, finally, you've got to figure out what. I mean, it's only been really the last kind of five years that I'm in my lane and I know what I'm good at and I know how to do it well. But there's been 25 years of really great times and not so great times. So. My advice is always just to go with your gut feel. I think having the confidence to keep getting up and ma- after you've made a mistake is really what makes you the person you are in the end and have a successful business like I have today. Is that like um, get out of my way, I'm going to spray everyone and I'm gonna, and, I, and at least I'm going to hit something as opposed to sitting down, thinking about it all purposefully and trying to target onto one particular aspect that you may, mm-hmm. you think you got? No, I think that's that's – so, so if, if I, so I had the modeling agency and knew that that wasn't right. So I exited that business and the money that I, that I, that I um, gained from that business, I, I used to start Model Co. In fact, I had Model Co running for two years while I had the agency going um, and basically one funded the other. But I'm very strategic when it comes to my next step. As an example, I had Model Co, which is my hero brand, which we've had for 20 years. And I, and I, can, and I can pivot quite quickly. So I had the agency, then I went to Model Co., then we were this first beauty brand in the world that was really cool. So back in the day when I started it, there was only Estee Lauder, Clinique, Chanel and all the bigger brands. And I said that, that I could really fill a niche in the market for a cool brand that was hot pink. And everyone said, well, why are you having – no one's going to buy hot pink cosmetics. I said intuitively I just knew hot pink was going to sell. It was sexy. It was on brand. I was very much entrenched in the fashion and beauty industry and knew a lot of celebrities and fashion editors and makeup artists from my modelling agency um, background. That's how I pivoted into, into beauty. So um, I knew that that was, it was intrinsically, I knew that was going to work. So I was very much radar locked on. I was going to create a beauty brand that was innovative and um, had must have beauty products that didn't compete with anyone else, that filled a void in the women's beauty routine, routine that all the other luxury brands weren't providing. And then 15 years into that, um, after working with Hayley Baldwin and Karl Lagerfeld and all these other um, ambassadors and collaborative um, partners, I knew that there was a, a huge space in the mastige beauty business against Maybelline, Rimmel, L'Oreal and all of the big giants. 
And that was when I created MCO Beauty. It's now the fastest growing Australian beauty brand. We've, we're outselling all of the major players in the market. We're driving 78% growth for Woolworths. I mean, it's, I know what I'm doing with that brand. So I don't, it's very much not about to do everything and make sure it sticks. It's about knowing the industry that you're in, knowing when to pivot, don't let things get old, um, stay on top of the game. Yeah, I mean, there, whilst it feels like sometimes it's a bit erratic and our business is quite agile, there is a lot of strategy behind what we're doing. That's interesting. You know, I mean, often people say to me, well, you always change your fucking mind. As a misinterpretation of what you're doing, um, that you're changing your, your, your strategy or you're changing All the your time. Mind. So I've got a team of 30 who thrive off the energy of the agility of the business. So we may have a marketing strategy for six months and then I'll come in one day and go, we've just done a deal with Celeste Barber. Sorry, we're changing it. We're going to do this. So there's always the underlying strategy. But then there's opportunities that come to us. There's opportunities that come to me every day. And once every two or three months, an amazing opportunity comes up which shifts the strategy. And you've got to be a certain type of um, employee to work with an entrepreneur like myself. So there's, whilst there's underlying strategy, there's huge scope um, for change. So we're, we're not like L'Oreal that gets handed the strategy from Paris out to Australia and you can't deviate. Working for me and the business is, um, it is agile and we do change our minds sometimes quite quickly. And, um, and I suppose it can be a challenge working with me to some extent, but then there's a huge amount of upside being a part of, of a business that's growing and being, for, for, for my staff to have their fingerprints on some amazing things that we've recently done and about to do. In my case, I, I, my, my response to people say that to me is that as an entrepreneur, like you just said, you've got to continually reassess where the market's going Correct. and it, it changes pretty quickly. And there's no point saying, oh, we're doing this because this is our plan. And the market's going the other direction because you're going to miss the game. And how much of this thought process that you employ, and and I hate the word pivot, but like you know, changeability is because of the fashion factor. At Emco Beauty, we create Lux for less products, um, so we, we constantly have our finger on the pulse of what the premium brands are doing, and we dupe a lot of what the bigger brands are doing. Example, there might be a particular. Um, concealer that does something with Chanel and that's cost $120, well, we say, well, how can we bring that to market a quarter of the price? So we're driven by trends in the market. Uh, we're also very much a, a social media brand. Social media has been basically the platform for the success of Emco Beauty and, and Model Co. So we're all, we've, we have a, anywhere between 100 and 200 influencers at any one time going out there talking about the brand or the product. So Sometimes it's driven by who the influencer is. So we sign Celeste Barber. She's obviously, you know, who she is and she's a real woman and she's, and I love her and she's great and her and I are very similar in some ways. It's like um, you want to give women what they want without all the BS around it. So we partnered with her. So, and that was an opportunity. So we had to pivot the brand and create products that kind of she resonated with. So then we're looking at another ambassador at the moment who's really big and she's come to me and she said, look, you know, I love all of this, but it's an opportunity for you to create XYZ lip products. So then I'll go into the R&D team saying, look, we're not really doing this lip product, but do you mind? Is there, is there a way we can fast track it? So we kind of work with talent, with fashion, with social media platforms. Their social media platforms? Yeah. So g j just can I unpick that a little bit? So when you pick someone like Celeste Barber, um, who I think she's fantastic um, and actually really funny, um, and I follow her actually on Instagram, funnily enough, um, but if you go back, 20 years ago, my gut feeling is if Celeste Barber had been around, you probably wouldn't have used Celeste Barber. So Model Co. is more of a premium brand. It's more of a fashion-based beauty brand. And you'd, Model Co. is that, that next level up. So we are more fashion, cool, where Emco Beauty, my second brand, which is a diffusion line to Model Co., is more mass market. So one one's more premium in department stores and um, premium e-com sites, where Emco Beauty is Woolworths, uh, Best and Less. Big W, so I've got that, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. But, so, but what, I'm, sorry, what I'm getting at though, Shelley, is that how important is it for you to react to the, the general consensus of the marketplace, those marketplaces and sub-markets? It's very important. Yeah. So, so we've yeah. got our finger on the pulse. We've got a huge database of a very um, uh, uh, active customer base. So, How do so, you do that? So, so we, our social media channel for, for both brands, um, especially MCO at the moment, is so strong that we will go out, I'll go into the office today and we're thinking about what we're launching in October and we're talking about it, it's, um, a, a new foundation. Do we do an all-based one, a water-based one, SPF? So we'll go to market at 3 o'clock and we'll go out to our database on Instagram stories and 
and say, would, out of all of these products, which one would you prefer? Within 15 minutes, we'll have thousands of answers. Oh, you, you do a survey oh, immediately. on your own, on on your own. own social? I, I drive, our products are created from what women really want. So every product we launch is because our customers want it. So, um, and we never have one face of the brand. Whilst we have ambassadors and celebrities and so on and so forth, the real women are the people that wear the products. So they'll go into Woolworths and buy a product and they'll Instagram themselves. They're, they're the products that we re -gram. They're the products that really, and that's been the success of MCO Beauty, that it, that it is a brand for all women. So we're so driven by what women want and we've got such a responsive customer base that we pre-ask what you want before we go up and launch it. We've got six profiles all the way work? from 6 to 60. So we've got, um, from what we understand our customer base to be, we've got six different women who purchase our products. We've got the tweens, then we've got the late teens and 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and they're all different income earners, they're, you know, young families, two people who can't, um, that they like to cross shop from Lux to Less. So they want to buy a bit of Chanel, but they also, or they want to buy their MS slides, but they want to bear, wear a pair of Ugg boots. They want to buy their Tom Ford makeup, but they also want a bit of Emco. Then we've got, you know, the, um, you know, the average working woman. So we, I feel like we've really got our customer base down pat. So there's a lens put over every single product that we launch to make sure that it slots into at least four of the six profiles. I'm just trying to get my head around this because, you know, fashion's not a, not high up on my list of stuff um, in terms of experience. Um, do you say, oh, Chanel just put something out? So Model Co, we, is a different approach with Model Co. So we don't look to the luxury brands and premium brands and say, what are they doing? We think about what women want in their beauty regime that no other brand has. Georgia Money just put it as foundation. They led with it. They've done all the research. Been That's M Co that does that. Model Co is a Georgia Money. Model I Co leads with innovation. This brand copies innovation. You copy someone else's innovation? Well, depends Sorta. on what it is. Like Because they're, they're markets. I mean, you know, these people got deeper Look, pockets. I would say, you know, there's research. half a dozen products in our range that are du duplicates of, you know, some big products. So Celeste, as an example, loves Tom Ford. She knows him personally and he's got a foundation range. Um, and she tried our products and said, you know what, this is, this is as good as Tom Ford's, but Tom Ford's is 120 and this is 20 bucks. Guys, you know what, if you can't afford Tom Ford, you can buy this one. So it's not us that really um, lead, lead that conversation. It's all of the thousands of people that buy our products that have purchased products from the luxury brands make that decision. Tom Ford's one's 120 bucks. Um, yours is 20. I mean, same outcome according to mm. Celeste. Why is one 120 and one's 20? I mean, how's that Well, you know, I, brands like Tom Ford are the luxury end of the market. He can't put out a $20 foundation. Why not? He's, I don't know. I mean, he's got suits of three, $4,000. He's putting out a, his positioning, his brand positioning is luxury or premium. You pay me for it. Pay me for it. And obviously there's different overhead structures and so on and so forth. But whether you're a fashion brand or a beauty brand, you have a position within the market. So whether or not you're doing clothing or shoes or beauty, it sits within that positioning. That positioning is high end. You've got a $120 foundation. Model Co's down here, so it's kind of premium. Our foundations at Model Co would be $45 to $50. But why, well, yeah, but tell me, why would, why would anybody, I don't understand. It, it, it's if women I, if buy I can buy the same shit for forty five bucks, I couldn't even fuck with it's got Tom Ford's name on there or not. Why would I buy Tom Ford's? Why does someone buy? Because Tom Ford's women name? and people are attracted to brands. That's the way it goes. Yeah, I get it. yeah. So <laughs> what suit? What, what brand suit do you wear? Well, when I was doing the TV show, I don't wear suits anymore. But when I was doing the TV show, but I still got all the suits because I I was a Giorgio <laughs> Armani ambassador. I had to wear it in the show because um, they sponsored the show. So, um, but I wouldn't go and buy a Giorgio Armani suit. No way because they're too expensive. Um, Mm. I got a mate, he's a good friend of mine, and um, he told me that he said he's a he's a tailor or whatever you call it, and he can make. He said I can make your suit for like, those are Georgia money yeah. suits from the same factory, hundred percent, same material. Like in fact, he said the material. He said I can get you Laura Piana or something uh, material, which is really apparently really good material. It's better than Georgia money material. Mm. He said I can make the suit for less than a thousand bucks. Um, right. Whereas a Georgia money is, probably, I don't know, today's probably worth five thousand dollars. I haven't got a clue. It's brand but, positioning. It's, so it's, it's a brand position. Where, where can that you brand explain is, to me? Why do people <laughs> pay that? Why, what is that? Explain. Like, what's the well, deal? It's. I mean, people people are trend and brand driven. Yeah, but when it comes to makeup, I mean, if the makeup, like your forty five dollar foundation, does the same as the other one for one hundred twenty bucks, assuming it's not going to pollute your face and uh, you can take it off equally as good doesn't stick on your skin and sort of make your skin drop off or something? I think it's something in the, in the experience. I think it's something about being able to afford that brand and therefore, you know, people on a budget, they want to spend X amount on their luxury goods and X amount on their on their less. They, they work out what to them feels more important. Yeah. I want to go to the break and ex come back and explore because 
you know, you've got good brands. Uh, you've got a luxury brand and, a, and a, an affordable brand, let's call it that for the moment. Um, and, you know, you've been in the game for a long time. You're in all sorts of stores and it's rolling and you're doing really well, growing faster than most of the big, big names. I actually want to explore this whole brand issue and how you deal with it in the second half. So let's go to the break. We'll come straight back. I'm back for the break with, here with Shelley Sullivan. Well, actually, I, I'm having a conversation about shit I don't have any idea about, so therefore I'm asking lots of questions that probably sound a bit dumb, especially to someone like Shelley who's been in this game for 30-odd years and <laughs> doing really well. But uh, when it comes to uh, – well, uh, let me ask you, do you wear luxury brands or use luxury brands for makeup? No. No. I honestly wear my own products. In I don't terms of my makeup. own products. Well, I create them. I, I know what luxury brands have. Sure, we have a bucket full of samples of every brand on the planet. But I personally use our own products. I mean, I'm an advocate for the brand. If I wouldn't wear it, I wouldn't sell it to someone else. So when it comes to beauty, I'm 100% Model Co and Emco. But when it comes to fashion and you mean clothes, clothing, yeah. I wear a combination of both. And yeah. I buy high-end brands because I like um, the style and the cut and shoes. I'm a shoe fan, so I've got lots of shoes. I buy a combination of both. Well, I remember when I turned uh, 50. I just did a big deal and I, I, I did quite well. So I decided to go and buy myself a watch and I went and bought myself – actually, the watch I got on now, um, which I would would not ordinarily wear. It's an IWC. You know, it's a pretty cool pilot watch. Um, and I wanted to reward myself with a really good fucking watch. Um, That's fair enough. Yeah, um, and I felt like it was a reward for 30 years of hard work. I'd probably go on a holiday before I'd buy a watch. Well, I went on a holiday well as well. I made it quite a bit of money, so I did a quite a few things, <laughs> not, not just that. That wasn't anything I did. But, but you know, like what I'm saying is uh, I did it for reward purposes, but I wouldn't do it every year. I wouldn't sort of sit down and say, now I'm going to buy myself this, this particular brand mm. or that particular brand. I've never been able to understand it, uh, understand the, proce- the thinking process whereby people do decide to have in their kit bag – you know, one or two luxury brands as opposed to luxury things. Well-made's perfect. I like well-made and, and things that are functional and things that are valuable too, by the way. I think there's a combination of I should have it, I want it, I can afford it. I don't think there's any one straight answer. I'm, I'm a bit like yourself. If, if I've achieved something incredible in my life, I want to reward myself. You might buy something nice, you know, a holiday or take the kids away or buy a new wardrobe or, you know. Because, um, I mean, I see Roxy's uh, just think goes, Page right, and uh, like man, she's on like a different brand thing every every day, every week, nearly. And I think to myself, well, she's she, you know, she talks to a market. There must be a market out there that she talks to. Um, I think she talks to a very brand driven market, and there are a lot of women out there that are brand driven that won't wear anything or walk around with anything that are luxury goods. In fact, they'd probably buy a fake product to have on their arm to say they're walking around with that brand. That's one type of woman. Then you've got you know the woman who wants to have a little bit of lux for less. That's what Emco is all about. Um, you know what? You can. We'll give you a luxury product for a much less price. Yeah, luxury product being high quality and expensive. Expensive in terms of the way it's been made, or uh, well, it could be the formula. The formula, yeah. But I don't have to pay overs. Correct. That's a well thought through, targeted thing. You know, like uh, intellectually. That's why Emco's doing so well. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but that's where Celeste Barber comes in. Someone like her. Yeah. So we have um, variation of ambassadors that are real women that talk to the everyday woman. I mean. There's a small portion of the population that can afford to buy luxury products these days, in my view, especially in cosmetics. And it's testament to the sales of MCO Beauty because if they're all out there buying luxury products, they wouldn't be buying mine. And how do you sell 10,000 units of a mascara a week? I mean, it's a lot of mascara. And the volume of product that we turn in our foundation and our brows, there is a huge community of women in Australia. We have about 150 products in MCO Beauty. And, and that's a small range compared to some brands have in Maybelline and various other um, other great brands have thousands of products. So we do serious volume of a lot of our products. So women in Australia, um, and we're starting to sell overseas, are trading down. I don't know what they've got in there. Sometimes we say we take a picky makeup bag and send it to us. But there is a large proportion of Australian women that now understand they don't need to overspend to get quality. Are they doing the same amount of stuff to themselves though? Like they're, they're not spending too much per item, but are they doing the, using the same amount of items of what, like eyebrow? Yeah, eyelash. our average basket size is like six or eight products, which is huge online. So they're shopping across our range. Like they're buying foundations and concealers and lipsticks and various other things. And I think they love what the brand stands for. They love that it's Australian. It's Australian woman that's running the brand. There's a lot of thought that go into our products. They're reasonably priced. Uh, we're cruelty-free. We're vegan. We're all, we hit all of those touch points. So I think that's what's accelerated the growth of of the business. Model Co is still very big in tanning and, um, and and it talks to a different customer. 
We've got customers that buy both. We've got customers that only buy one. Predicting scientifically where people's um, tastes are going or where their preferences are going. You mentioned something about vegan and uh, other things. Cruelty you, free. Cruelty free. What does that mean for a start? There's no animal-based um, products in our formulations. You mean no lanolin, for example? Yeah. Um, people want um, and, our, and our customers want products that are as natural as possible. They're all big, big on sustainability. Um, they love as many. Our, our entire skincare collection is, is Australian made. We put it together in Australia and yeah. majority of the formulation, or well, all of the formulations are Australian made. But going back to cruelty-free and vegan, the, these are touch points and this is just the way the world's going. People want things that are clean, vegan, cruelty-free. So we have to move with the trends as well. So we um, are kind of ahead of the time. I, the, sustainability is the next one. So I've ticked the clean box. Environment, you Yeah. Talking. So now yeah. less plastic, so on and so forth. So whilst we're producing quality products, we're also looking to what else ticks the box when a customer makes a choice for what brand that they If you go back 30 buy. years. No one cared. No one cared. Or well, they didn't know. They, well, they probably, didn't know. They might have cared, but they just didn't have a, a view on it. Yeah. No one thought about this sort of stuff. So are you doing this because this is what people expect of you or you or are you doing this because Shelley Sullivan's on a march to make sure there's no cruelty to animals? Both. Both. I'm very realistic when it comes to what needs to be what needs to be done within the cosmetics industry. So um, cruelty free was something that started to raise its head maybe five years ago. And if I can do something that's going to benefit animals, then great. Let's 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 um, support that. But when your customers come in hard and say, you know, seventy eight percent of women, I think it was, wanted products that were cruelty free. So it's always a balance. Okay, of, of what I believe in versus what customers want. Do your views have to align with the customers' views? And if which one takes precedence? No, the customers take precedence. Always take precedence. Always. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, do you have to moralise or arm wrestle yourself about that sort of shit? No. Or, but whatever, his customers all of a sudden said, "You know what? This is ridiculous." But we want we want animal products because there's something that we've. No. Ch- if the world's changed the view. What would you say? Once we pick a lane and we've got a brand strategy, so our our, our we stick to it. So. Um, with Emco Beauty, we're Lux for Less, we're Bullshit Free Beauty. That's our, that's our tagline, BS Free Beauty. So everything we give to you is bullshit free. We tell you exactly how it is, um, so on and so forth. So we, we pretty much stick to our strategy, stick to our lane. Um, if somebody says all of a sudden I want animal products, well, we're already in our lane. We've already made that strategic decision. We're not changing it. Right, okay. So And, and you've got like a, a chemist or some, some dude. We use third-party manufacturers. We don't have our own um, chemist and so on. So we have a warehouse. We've got thirty staff at head office. Uh, we have a whole research and development department that globally source products from all around the planet. I'd imagine the next iteration of all this is plastic free. So yes, yeah, sustainability I mean, you, is going to be next. It's so be, you're wrapping. I mean, how most do you wrap of it yourself? is already sustainable. Um, nearly most of it's recyclable. So at the moment, it's mainly cardboard, and there's a bit of plastic that holds it down. So we're going through a process to make sure that any plastics that we have are recyclable. And what about the the tube or whatever it is? Same. Where do you see what customers' expectations are, where do you see them going in terms of, let's call it sustainability and uh, recycling and all that sort of stuff? Because, I mean, like I, I guess stuff is as recyclable, but, okay, I, I re- put it in the recycling bin, but I'd rather not have it in the first place. I'd rather not have the fucking plastic. I mean, I'm, I'm actually sick of plastic. I, mean, I know sometimes it's really important and it's functional, but I just think things are over overwrapped. For me, I don't even, even think that um, – Recyclable is a good outcome. Look, it'd be easy for me if there's no plastic at all, and I could find a so- solution to hang my products. However, it's not practical in my world because you walk into a worse or to um, the shopping environment, and you've got a whole bunch of pegs, and you've got to find a way to put your product on a peg. You've got to find a way to sell it. Then you've got to find a way a customer that to look at it. So you're going to have to have some form of plastic so they can see through it. So we're we're seeing how we can move forward and also not take the product out and damage it. So right now in the way the beauty products are showcased in store, we have to have an element of plastic. But I'm looking at ways to try and eliminate that in the future. Is that frustrating? Yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, do you like... Well, I'm, 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 it's not one simple answer. You've yeah. got you know, you've got to put your product on a peg, so you need to showcase the product so people can't touch it or shrinkage where people are testing it. So I have to have plastic which covers a product. So we're, we're exploring different ways at the moment of using um, plastics that are recyclable, plastics... I mean, it's an ongoing issue. Yeah. So I wish there wasn't plastic, but unfortunately in my business there's got to be a bit of it for totally. now. Are you feeling the pressure though from 
just generally um, is a thing yes. rising up in people's gut. I think I think it's coming from our retailers as well that they, they want to enforce as much sustainability as possible. And I think it's across all of the various different departments within grocery. Yeah, it's, de- it's definitely a point of contention that's going to continue to grow. So we're already ahead of the game. We're already eliminating as much plastic as we possibly can. With Model Co, mm-hmm. um, I mean, being strategic is really important, but what are some of the biggest achievements in your strategy thinking and the way you thought? With Model Co, we've been on many different um, journeys with big celebrities. Um, we worked with Elmick Furson for three years, Rosie Huntington-Whiteley, um, Hayley Baldwin, now Hayley Bieber. But I, I would say probably one of the biggest challenges and probably one of the most rewarding um, projects that I've ever worked on was um, Model Co for Karl Lagerfeld. So that came about um, off the back of the success of Hayley Baldwin. Um, we were featured on the front cover of Women's Wear Daily, a great licensing agency called DMA United in New York, saw that this Australian beauty brand had collaborated with a, with a talent and wrote to me and said, um, would you be interested in doing a Karl Lagerfeld beauty collection? And at the time I didn't know, I'm like, Karl Lagerfeld and beauty? I mean, to work with the biggest fashion icon that there ever has been, of course you'd want that opportunity. So um, we embarked on a journey of a tender process that started with 27 brands that got down to a few brands. I uh, went to Paris a couple of times and pitched to the CEO of the business and and a lot of brands had tried to go for a 10-year deal and I walked in and I just intuitively knew, no, this is a quick shot two-year deal. Um, so I, I, my strategy, I never saw the others, but I know it was completely different to theirs. Um, the world was going into social media and digital and all the beauty brands, were, everything was digital. I'm like, no, this is an old, an old school brand that has to be bricks and mortar. So I put forward a strategy to do um, a global beauty collaboration with Carl. There were 52 products. We had lip glosses with lights and mirrors and this kind of all this technology. And I said to the CEO of the company, you know, what do you want to achieve? They said, we want to do a big beauty event where everybody else was saying, you don't do a beauty event these days. It's all about digital. So we ended up executing probably one of the biggest beauty collaborations in history. Um, we took over Place Vendôme. We stopped the streets of Paris with 100 lookalike Carl heads. And we um, had this huge event in Paris. Um, we call it Painting Paris Pink. So we literally took over Paris, achieved the unimaginable and had this incredible event um, to celebrate the launch. We ended up in 3,000 stores in 27 countries around the world. Wow. And I knew that day that I got that email, we were going to do it. Wow, that's so cool. And Carl Lagerfeld is the coolest dude ever, like the way he walks around. It just There's something about him is a mystery. I've never heard him speak. He yeah, just, so, like, just so appears so and disappears. He, he's, um, he's actually, I think he's been passed now for about two years. Yeah, but he's a cool um, dude. But he was, um, when I met him, you met he him? was a lot shorter than what, I thought he was going to be. Do you have glass, like dark yes, glasses? Yes, yeah, dark glasses. We actually sat, um, we, we, throughout the duration of the three years, I worked a lot in Paris. So we travelled around the world, but I worked really close with the Lagerfeld team. So I spent a lot of time in Paris there and he had his office set up and um, he used to obviously, um, he was creative director of Chanel and uh, Fendi and obviously his his own brand, it was a licensed brand. So he would come in and sign off on the collections. So he'd come in and they'd have meetings and he'd sign off and give his creative direction and off he'd go and, I was in Paris one day and we were just starting the, the relationship and I met with him and shared with him the lip gloss and the light and um, here various other products that we were creating together and he seemed like a lovely guy, um, very funny. Told me I was funny when I was spraying him with our shimmer in a can. Um, but, yeah, I mean, look, it was a great opportunity. I think, I think really um, that was a pinnacle part for me in my career and the brands because Emco Beauty didn't exist then um, and the strategy was always – okay, after we launched Carl Lagerfeld, we're going to go and put Model Co in all these stores around the world. But by the time I got to the end of Carl Lagerfeld, there were so many brands in the premium market. I saw a niche in the mass stage market and said, well, you know, Model Co will still be what it is. Um, but then we launched MCO Beauty and I went in a different direction. But definitely working with the team at Carl Lagerfeld and um, Al Weeks and all of my creative team, um, it, was, it was the most incredible journey um, and one that I don't think, I don't know if you can ever top that. What a bust. Who else? Actually, I have had a phone call from someone who I can't say and most of like, wow, if you get that deal, that's bigger than Carl Lagerfeld. But who knows, Mark? I could be doing a collaboration again quite soon. Hey, mate, you might be doing a – let's do a men's <laughs> deal and, you, I and I, you and I can collaborate. I know. You know, Woolies have come to us and said, you know, do you want to do some men's products? So you know what? We're, we're up for a challenge. I better go and get some surgery there before I do it all. <laughs> Where to from here? What are you going to do? Are you going to retire? Are you going to keep going, keep kicking it around? Look, um, there's, there's a lot of growth. Within both brands, over the next year or two, we're going to continue to expand Emco Beauty. 
There's a huge amount of local opportunity to expand the distribution in the market. Um, we're looking at US opportunities at the moment to grow that brand. Um, as it stands now, we've got a great business. Um, we know what we're doing and we have some expansion plans over the next two to three years, especially with Emco. Model Co is more of a boutique brand that's more online and it's, it has a whole heritage of customers that have been buying the brand as I've grown with the brand and for the last, you know, 20 years, we're nearly 20 years old. Um, so, look, we've got some great growth plans for both brands, um, lots of innovation in the pipeline. We're talking about doing another collaboration with another international celebrity at the moment and Model and Emco is just going to continue to create Lux for Less Bullshit Free Beauty products. And by the way, I have to tell you, Shelley, since I haven't seen you in uh, six years, Time has stood still for you. Maybe it's a testament to your products. Thank you. Um, how important is it that you have to stay like that? Look, I think I'll always want to do my best to look as, as good as you can. I mean, that's what most women, are, especially being in the beauty and fashion industry, I don't overly try. I just am who I am. What's but there is pressure. to You can't look like a fucking shit bag. I mean, you got to, you know. You <laughs> oh, you should see me running around the office. I've got no shoes on. I'm like this crazy nah, but still, but I've but hardly got any makeup on. I mean, I'm very down to earth. I think as I age, I'll, I'll just be who I am. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to be one to have plastic surgery and, you know, um, try and stay 40 forever. Um, I, I use my own products. So I obviously, we've just launched a range of skincare. I've got so many women who write to me all the time saying, you're 48 and how come you've got great you still got skin and uh, skin still got is, skin. That's I've good. still got skin. I've still got skin that's not completely wrinkly. So um, I use my own skincare products and skin and hair and health and um, beauty is very important to me. So I think as I, I mean, I hope to look as young as I can for as long as I can. I think every woman does. But as as you as I grow old, I'll age with grace, hopefully. Yeah. Well, well you ha you have by the way, but I Thank don't think you. you've aged at all since I've seen you last. But and I mean, I guess that's got a lot to do with your lifestyle. So. Has your is I mean you're you're a Bondi girl, weren't you? Well, like a East Suburbs girl. East and Suburbs yeah. girl. Yeah. So yeah. um and by the way, when you were an East Suburbs kid, East Suburbs wasn't like it is today. I mean, 100%. It was totally different. Yeah. Um and a little bit yeah, East Suburbs a little bit bogany. Um, you know, it was <laughs> Bondi definitely, Paddington for sure. Um, not these days, it's very gen, uh, gentrified. But um you have maintained your style through the whole process. Do you think that your business has driven you to be that person or um, that person is always instinctively inside you and you've driven your business to display that person? So, do you ever feel pressure? You don't feel pressure. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good because that's the worst thing. I mean, like, because it becomes obvious. That's how one operates gracefully. Because if you don't have pressure, then you can be graceful. And the gracefulness, a lot of times, comes about as a result of confidence. You know your shit. You you know your stuff, and you're doing well. I see a lot of people I know who have been in business like you around this time in their life sell out. I don't mean sell out like in terms of abandon their customer base, but they sell. They say, well, fuck, I've been doing this forever. There's a good earn. Someone's offered me money. I don't know. One of the Maybelline's offered me a deal. Do you get pressured or courted by the marketplace to cash in your chips and uh, sail off merrily into the sunset? Yeah, I mean. Because you know, like, uh, <laughs> I, 
Well, that's what I'm trying to get to because I mean that. Well, I, I got I got seduced into selling the whiz business, which in hindsight I wish I hadn't done to be frank with you. But I got seduced into a lot of money, blah blah blah. This is um, a long time ago, fifteen years ago, sixteen years ago. Um, now I've got the yellow brick road business, and you know it's the same size, in fact, a bigger business, and uh, you know many more people work for me, etc. Um, and I recently got, we had our annual conference uh, a week or two ago. And I was getting asked by the people who work for me, you're not going to sell, are you? Because, you know, these are people joining up my business as franchisees. They don't want me to, you know, they're joining because of me. A lot of them do. They don't want to see me just load up and sell. You know, they want me to hang in there. And my response is I'm not selling. I mean, I'm my percentage, you know, because we're a listed public company, but I'm the biggest individual shareholder. Um, I'm not for sale, okay? Whatever happens, if, if someone comes and mops up every other shareholder, they're not going to get mine, okay? I'll, I'm staying in. Because I, for me, it's a lifestyle. It's I like doing this in my life. It's something I love doing, and I I want to do this. You know, I, I you know, if I if I was to pick an iconic person, you know, I want to be like Rupert Murdoch when he's eighty six. I don't want to be getting married at eighty six to Jerry Hall, but um, but I want to be in business with my kids, whatever. But I want to be in this business, even without my kids. I want to be in this business because this is a business I love, and, and often I get courted, big money to to take a check and go. But I have this own com- my conflict, you know, like, you know, I'm a Greek and I like to take the money. Um, but at the same time, I want to stay in this game because I don't want to go and reinvent myself and start all over again or what I just, and what am I going to, I'm not going to retire, sit around and fucking play golf or somewhere I go. So, and, you know, mentor doesn't take that much time from me. I love this business, but, you know, this is more a fun business for me, mentor. I do this for fun. Do you have the same conflict? I mean, do you go through that or are you too young for that now? Not really. I mean, I'm not- I know that I've made a mistake gone out um, years and years and years and I've made great but it's probably not like it's not like it's not like it's not um I feel in my own way that I've made a great mistake and I've made a great mistake and I've made a great mistake and I've made a great I love my marriage I love my family I love my look at friends No matter what I do, I can sell. Be clear on that. I love my family. I love myself. I love my kids. But I can, I mean, whilst I can see that I've made a mistake, I've got a great mentor. But he was my mentor. So, would it be fair to say that Model Co and MCO, and even the event business, has been a platform that Shelley Sullivan chose when she was 18 and just, she's just evolved it? To allow her to express her ability to create stuff, be creative, and also to connect. I love that. I'm a creative. Yeah, and connect, create, create and connect. Create. So uh, maybe if you know, on your tombstone, she loved to create and connect. But no, but that's what that's what it yeah. seems to me. Like I'm busy talking to you for now, and it seems to me that Shelley loves to create. She's just chosen fashion as a platform to create and connect. That's pretty cool. So why the fuck would you ever move away from that? Because you've got to do that. That's the sort of thing you're going to want to do for the rest of your life. So that, that's cool. That answers my question because I'm the same. I like to help. That's why we lend money, help people get a house. You know, like most of us are not lucky enough. We're lucky to have an opportunity, in your case, to create and connect. In my case, to help and connect. I have platforms. You have platforms. Most people don't ever get that opportunity. And that's what entrepreneurs really are driven to do yeah. creating connecting creating connecting helping connecting you know like that's what entrepreneurs do everyone talks about entrepreneurs entrepreneurs is that and the other but i reckon that's the thing that drives them being creative and connecting so you're, you're a perfect example of it which is exactly the reason why i think it was fordham to put you up to the show yeah, yeah that was your talent manager at the time yeah. so young nick and uh who's you know not that young any morning anymore he's doing very well for himself but um put you in the show yeah. as an adjudicator because all the celebrities, they don't really, to be frank, they don't get it. They connect, but they don't create. And what our job was, yours and my job, you know, me as the host, but you as a, an advisor on the show, an adjudicator, was to see whether they knew how to create. And that's the – can they, can they do it? Yeah, get your act together. Stop like reading your lines in front of a camera. And, uh, and it's amazing, you know, how only one or two would ever shine out. And there's not that many people who understand that. 
In my mind? Yeah. 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 I, I know who I got in my mind, but I had production teams always pushing their own people. So, you know, you know how it works. There's a big production team in there. You know, have an, an editorial meeting every morning at 7 a.m. and they would be basically telling me who they think should win. But I would have in my mind, day one, I knew from the, looking at the group who I think was going to be a winner. But it was, it was a great experience. We're lucky. You and I are so lucky. We're lucky that we're driven as entrepreneurs. And I just wanted to finish off of that. Entrepreneurs always have the common denominator of connection of something, whether they use marketplaces or online marketplaces or physical marketplaces, whether they use a product or whether they're in the fashion industry, in the finance industry in my case, they're always connecting people to themselves, their own ideas. So Shelley Sullivan, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your honesty, by the way, because I did sort of push into a little bit. Again, for me, I want to thank you very much for an opportunity to hear what your view is on these things. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Cool.